So, uh, my name is Alexander, I'm one of the instructors in the program, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Andy Clymer. Uh, Andy is a typeface designer and developer at Heffler & Co. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree uh, in graphic design from uh, San Diego State University. He also holds a Master's of Design degree in typeface design uh, from the Type of Media postgraduate uh, program at the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. While in The Hague, Andy was influenced heavily by the notion that type designers uh, have had for centuries of building one's own tools for the job, mechanical bits and pieces historically, and now bits and pieces of software. Uh, this carries through into his role at h and where he contributes both to the design of retail and custom typefaces and to the software that helps produce them. Uh, this, is, uh, this is exactly what he's going to talk to us tonight. Uh, I also want to add a small belated happy birthday to Andy. It was his birthday a couple of days ago, so please help welcome Andy Kleiman. Hi, thanks Sasha. Um, also, thanks, Kara, for inviting me to do a talk like this here. Um, this is a, a fun place to do a talk like this because it's not so much of like a marketing thing about a new typeface, but uh, since it's you know this lecture series is associated with the Type of Cooper program, it could really get a little bit more technical, or it could be a little bit more something that maybe you want to go home and do some homework afterwards, and you know look into something. So yeah, it was a lot of fun to put together. So thanks again. Thanks for everyone uh, for being here. Um, and also, definitely thanks to my colleagues at Heffler and Company for uh, sponsoring the stream for this. So for all you at home watching this, um, so I'm wanted to talk today about uh, the process that kind of uh, built this uh, typeface Obsidian, which came out uh, just earlier this year, um, because the stuff uh, surrounding Obsidian um, really has a lot to do with a lot of interests that I had um, in the last. Uh, few years. Uh, 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 my work as a type designer is always influenced by the tools that I use, but um, actually, just one second, I'm going to switch to this. There we go. Does that still work? Cool. My notes weren't here, <laughs> just in case. Um, so the typeface Obsidian, uh, it was built with some new kind of processes that I was, I guess I was experimenting with, and some new uh, interests that I guess I had in the last few years. Um, I was thinking also that maybe I could leave this animated GIF going for 45 minutes and it might be interesting enough. Uh, but uh, there's more to it than that. So, um, so I want to kind of give you a lay of the land for how a type designer such as myself works kind of on a daily basis. Uh, this is a view in Robofont, which is the type design application that we use at Heffler & Company and also that the students here in the Type of Cooper program use. And what's kind of interesting about uh, Robofont is uh, kind of fresh out of the box, it's a very minimal type design application. So uh, this view of, a, of an editing window with, with Obsidian actually, um, you see a little tool panel up on the top left and you really only have just the basics to kind of get by in type design. So you have a selection tool for just selecting points, moving things around. Um, you have a pin tool for drawing curves, of course. There's a slice tool just to cut up curves and to add points to your drawing. Uh, measurement tool. And then there's another tool for kind of removing overlaps and combining, uh, combining contours. Uh, so it's really just kind of like the basics that you really need. And I was actually giving a workshop here with Frederick Berlain, who's the developer of Robofont. And uh, it was here just a couple years ago, and one of the students uh, as he was going through and kind of explaining how the tools work, someone asked, uh, but where's like the, the circle tool or the square tool? You know, just the kind of basic things that you'd expect a, a vector drawing application to have. Um, and I'm paraphrasing here, him here by saying this, but I'm pretty sure he said something like this, uh, because my circle may be different than your circle, is why he decided not to include a circle tool in Robofont. And I was, I was helping give that, uh, that uh, you know, workshop with him, and even I was thinking, like, what does that even mean? What does he mean that, <laughs> that my circle is different than, than your circle? And you know, I was thinking, you know, like, this is a circle. No matter where you are in the world, this is so pure and simple. Um, and we're not even talking about squircles here. 
which which is a new word that I learned recently. I always knew these as superlipses, but but it's the circle. This is what we're talking about. How is my circle different than your circle? Um, and I really started thinking about it, and I thought um, maybe it actually does make some sense that we're not as type designers, we're not just drawing perfectly geometric shapes, we're drawing letters in the end. So even if we take this, this circle, this perfect circle, and maybe add a counterform to it, uh, is this an O? Uh, maybe it is in, in the most perfectly geometric typeface design. Maybe there's only a few occasions when you'd really need such a, a perfectly mathematically you know, sound uh, circle. Um, and even then, does that even really look like it's the, the right form, even in a geometric typeface? Um, to my eye, I look at this and I'd, I'd want to make some small corrections to it. You know, it looks a little bit too perfect and it looks not letter-like, I guess. It looks too much like a circle and not a letter O. So to my eye, maybe I'd want something a little more like this. And that's the tiniest difference if I go back and forth, but I hope it's visible out there, that to my eye, this is what feels right. This is what feels comfortable for a circle when I'm trying to draw an O. You know, so I'm not drawing a perfect circle or perfect square. I need to draw an O in the end. Um, and I think it's even more clear when we look at like an oval that a tool like this might draw. So uh, a tool that draws a with a perfect, more geometric oval might make an oval like that in the in the drawing application. And then when you fill it in and add a counter. Is that an acceptable O for your you know, extremely condensed uh, geometric typeface? Um, to me, I might want something a little bit different. Maybe, maybe this is more of the kind of oval that I wish my tool would draw, because when I fill it in and add a counter, to my eye, that feels like a better compressed geometric O shape. You know? So we're, we're not really looking at these perfectly geometric circles and ovals anymore, but we're really trying to draw letters with the tools that we use. Um, but then going even further, maybe even something like this could be the way that an oval or a circle tool could work. Um, because this could be a very valid uh, letter form for a compressed, uh, you know, a geometric O. So maybe the, the regular width would still be a circle, but as it compresses, maybe the, the sides just get flat or something. Um, so if you start kind of trolling, uh, following this train of thought a little bit, then maybe it starts making sense that you know my O or my circle is different than your circle, you know, just in the the design that I'm doing on one day to the next or that you're doing. Um, but still, you know, with these as the the minimum set of tools that maybe you need as a as a type designer, uh, it could still be very useful to have a circle tool or a square tool even if it's still perfectly geometric and even if you're never really going to use it uh, just in that perfect kind of way. So of course uh, a circle tool is available as a, as a free add-on in Robofont. So the, the program that we design in, it's designed to be extended to work the way that, that you want to work or the way that I want to work. I'll kind of set up my set of tools for what I'm doing and you can set tools the way that, that you want to work and maybe you have a different circle tool because of that than I do. Um, and then it, it can really go from there where the application can just be extended further and further to any other kinds of crazy tools that you think of or you know, someone else has thought of and put out there. And a lot of these are free and you, know, you, can, you can find things uh, uh, just to extend your version of Robofont. Um, but back to that circle. Um, so even though this circle, this perfectly pure circle, even though I might not really use that ever in a type design, this, this, this circle may never show up somewhere. Um, it's not really the tool's job, I think, to draw perfect O's. It's really there to draw perfect circles so that I could take this circle and then maybe make my adjustments to this, you know, something so small. Uh, the tool kind of exists there to, uh, you know, help us because that would take quite a lot of time to even try to draw this shape if I really wanted to get it perfect. Take a lot longer than drawing out a circle and then kind of tweaking it. So it's, it's not really the job of the tool to uh, do all the work for you, but it's there to kind of assist you in your role as a designer. And so when I speak about tools and tools that are used in type design throughout the rest of this talk, uh, this is kind of what I'm thinking about and this is what I'm talking about. It's, it's the kind of tool that is 
more of just a, an assistant and maybe does a lot of the work for you, even maybe 90% of the work for you, but it's still up to you to, to be the, the designer and use your own eye and to you know, judge uh, how you'd want to use the tool. Um, I also <clears throat> want to talk for going too much further about a lot of the people that kind of made our tools like RoboFont work this way um, in the last maybe 20, 25 years or so. Um, I think we owe a lot to uh, these designers at Letterer. So there's Just Van Rossum and Eric Van Blockland, who were also teachers of mine that um, kind of pioneered, at least in the last chunk of years, um, this idea of uh, uh, maybe kind of programming your own tools and uh, augmenting your, your process. And they've made the kind of typefaces that uh, really rely on their own their own software, their own ways of working, kind of breaking aside from, from the usual. And then also uh, Peter Van Blockland, who was another teacher of mine at the Royal Academy in The Hague, um, was, I think, very influential for me and a lot of other type designers in the, in the past bunch of years. And Tal Lemming, who is a designer, who is also a developer who's really making some of the best applications that we use as type designers, and just seeing the process that these folks work in their type design has really been a, a huge influence on me and in the kind of work that, I'm, that I've done with Obsidian. Because um, they've really kind of made the back end that if you do want to program your own tool, if you do want to learn some Python and write something, then maybe you'd be using uh, RoboFab, which is a, a package of uh, Python uh, scripts and tools and things that you can uh, ex extend into your own work. And then, of course, uh, Frederick Berlain, who made RoboFont. So kind of none of this is really possible without these people to kind of like lay the groundwork and to already be working this way and to give us an environment that we could work on like this. So I just wanted to thank them really quick. Um, and also, so you're here to hear about Obsidian, but to talk about Obsidian is to really start by talking about Surveyor. So the typeface Surveyor, which came out uh, a couple years ago from Heffler and Company, um, this was the, kind of the starting point that I was using to explore some new ideas in that kind of ended up as Obsidian. Um, so Surveyor was really, it was started really I think back in 1997, I think that was the date that Jonathan Heffler kind of started the original drawings. Um, and then it of course came to completion in the early 2000s by Jonathan and Tobias and Jesse Reagan where it was a customization for Martha Stewart Living Magazine. So for Martha Stewart, there was really kind of the lighter end of the family. There were uh, Roman and Italic, uh, a fine cut that used at larger sizes and a text version. So it was really more of like the lighter end of the family. And then, and then about 2011, I was involved in contributing along with uh, Aoife Mooney, another person who was a designer with us, um, to the heavier end of the family. So kind of trying to bring some of that to completion for retail sale. Um, so I spent a lot of time with the drawings in Surveyor, at least in the heavier end, <coughs> uh, kind of earlier on. Um, so for Surveyor, for a family like Surveyor, it has a relatively standard kind of design space that we'd work within. Um, the common way that you might work is you draw in the extremes. So we would draw masters for the lightest end of the family and the heaviest end of the family, but then also, in the case of Surveyor, we draw for the, the largest size that it's meant to be used. So there was a cut that was supposed to be used at you know, very large sizes, and then also the smallest size, so the text versions. And then from these masters that you're drawing within, so you're really kind of just spending most of your time in four Roman masters and then four Italic masters, um, from these, you could then interpolate a set of weights out of it. So from this light and black, you can make a book weight that's kind of partway through. Um, and then you can kind of make a medium weight that's sort of like a halfway blend and a bold weight. And then, of course, that black weight. Um, and then between the two of these, just to give like a whole lay of the land for a surveyor, between the fine and text versions, uh, there is also an interpolation to make a display version. Uh, and then the same again throughout all the italics. So this is kind of like the design space that we were working in with Surveyor. Um, so for these, these interpolations, uh, they're not magic. You're not going to kind of draw four things and then throw them in there and say, 
just give me a medium or give me this or give me that. Um, it could take a lot of care in the drawings to be able to get a quality interpolation, let this quality kind of blend out of the different masters. And so oftentimes designers will also design toward the middle of the family to not have to sort of interpolate or blend through such a wide range of, uh, of styles. So maybe you'd also draw on the medium. Uh, we weren't going to do that here with Surveyor, so it was going to take some extra care to get the, all the points kind of in the right place in these, these further extreme ends of the family. Um, and it was a challenge because the, take the counter shapes and these two O's, they change so much through a range of weights that they really kind of needed more points just to kind of uh, make the same shape be able to happen in different parts of the family. Um, so Surveyor ended up with kind of on average about twice as many points as, a, as your standard type family would have. So on the left is Mercury text medium, but then on the right is Surveyor's text medium weight. And so it kind of needed twice as many points along the curves, uh, partially to, just to make Surveyor's uh, characteristic shape possible, but then also to make these interpolations happen a little bit better between such a, a wide range of styles. Um, I want to kind of explain a little bit, so what is, what is this idea of an interpolation? What's really happening when you have uh, you know, a lightweight, so let's say on the left there's the master for the, the fine light A, and then on the right that's the text black A. So if we were to try to blend the two of these, if we were to try to interpolate something uh, kind of halfway, what's really happening is this, is um, the, the program is going point by point, whoops, let me go back. So the program is going point by point, and it tries to find the same point between the two masters. So let's say if this is like a 50% interpolation between two things, uh, on the left side, uh, the, it's, it's going to find the distance, kind of like the halfway distance between the same point in the left master and the one in the right master, and then it draws it. And then it might move on to the next one, find the halfway point between the two of those, and draw it, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the structure of the two drawings that it's trying to interpolate have to match completely in terms of not just the number of points, but really where the points lie on each drawing. So they really have to completely match up. Um, and then in the end, so in this case, you get kind of a display medium interpolation between the two of those. Um, so it could be a lot of work to get these extra points kind of set up in the right place. So if the points weren't in the right place, and I know I'm going really deep and far into interpolation, we're not even talking about obsidian yet, but um, if the points are not in the right place, then this is something that might happen. So through the interpolation, you'll see kind of a kink happen as that point that's marked red uh, is trying to sort of blend with, uh, with its counterpart in the other master. But uh, since it was really not at the right place on the curve, it wasn't at a really compatible place with the other master, uh, you might think everything is going to work OK, but then you look at these interpolations and it might be a little bit off. There might be just a little bit of problem halfway. So um, a corrected version might do something like this. So if the points are in more of a compatible location between the two curves, then you'll get something nice halfway. Um, so with Surveyor, I'm, I'm going so far into explaining interpolation with Surveyor because this is kind of where where I was really working a lot at a certain time. I was working with making some new tools to visualize interpolations to kind of see what would really happen when we blend these masters that are so far apart in the design space. And then I was working a lot with tools to make corrections within these masters, so moving points around within outlines, um, which could really be quite a lot of work to go through hundreds of hundreds of glyphs and try to make sure that every point is really in the right place uh, in every master that you're going to interpolate. So my head was really kind of deeply into uh, just the workings of Surveyor's outlines, I guess, and making tools that, uh, that work with Surveyor's outlines. So that's kind of like one angle that I guess I came into to Obsidian with. Um, another thing that was really kind of amazing starting into working on uh, Surveyor was coming into a project partway through or very far of the way through, which, which I did, is uh, 
just going through the source material that was used as reference throughout the design is just an amazing uh, uh, thing to do. You know, you get like a kind of a mini uh, type or lettering history when you start a project like this, or you start in on something someone else has been working on. And for Surveyor, uh, the design on the lighter half of the family is really uh, influenced a lot by the, the kind of engraved lettering on maps. And so there were you know, a lot of amazing samples of this sort of lettering style that turned into this lighter end of Surveyor. But on the heavier end, which I was contributing some to the drawing, there wouldn't always be uh, so many examples in maps. Uh, whenever things would get heavier, they would often just get more ornamented. So you'd have these kind of light, sometimes monoline, or like just a very small amount of contrast uh, in this sort of lighter lettering style. But then as it gets heavier, you're going to find something more like this word Mitchell's, where you know, as the letter gets bigger, it's not filled in solid, but it's just kind of filled in with, with some kind of ornamentation or decoration. And um, my couple of theories that I had for why we were really seeing this is uh, just the technique of engraving a letter. I think it would take a lot more time to actually go through and really fill in a large form uh, just to make it completely black by cross-hatching or stippling than it, than it would be to uh, just fill it in with some decoration and maybe leave a lot of it open. So I think sometimes maybe that's why you'd see this style. Um, but also in a case like this slide, uh, when, it go, when a letter goes large on a map, you don't want it to obscure like a, a river or a state border or something. So a lot of times these forms are really open and, and decorative, but uh, would l still let something kind of show through. Um, so as we were designing in the heavier end of the family, the reference material that I was kind of given was more like this. We were looking more toward the fat faces of Vincent Figgins or things from Bruce's. Um, so kind of from a different but more related uh, area. But in the samples that I was looking through, they're still just so full of so many ornamented and shaded and decorated typefaces that this is something that I really always kind of hope that we'd like, find a way to kind of get back to, that even though we were working in Surveyor with a limited kind of range where um, we weren't going to get so decorative in Surveyor, that uh, I always kind of wanted to start sketching around and playing around with something with a little more ornamentation, uh, since I love these things that I was seeing. And even a lot of the, the examples that I was seeing, they already kind of look so much like some part of Surveyor, like this could really be like a medium display cut with, with just a little bit of you know, decoration on it, and it just looks so beautiful. So yeah, and, and same with this. It was, it was something that I really just kind of wanted to find a way to get into. Um, I decided that I was going to try to find some time to explore this area, but since I'd spent so much time uh, making tools for Surveyor and doing a lot of programming and working with the, the contours and points in Surveyor itself, that I was going to kind of make a challenge to myself to try to draw some ornamentation with code. So it was going to be a way to kind of maybe improve my uh, skills as a programmer while still having kind of like a type design project to work on at the same time. Um, so that's what I set out to do. Uh, so there was a lot of exploration. This was before things came together as what we call Obsidian today, but there was, I put in a lot of exploration into the kinds of ornamentation that I was seeing in a lot of these maps or, or books. And I kind of made a sample sort of taxonomy of what I was seeing and the things that I liked. So sometimes uh, there were a lot of shadows and maybe shadows could be combined in different ways. So there could be a solid shadow or, a, or an open shadow or a cross-hatched kind of shadow. Um, I would sketch kind of things that I was seeing with, with these forms where I thought maybe it was more of like a, a panel kind of shape within a letter and then maybe subdivisions of a panel. So maybe it's just uh, yeah part of a panel. Or I was seeing uh, a lot of ornamentation that looked like it filled in those, those same kind of panels. So maybe if there was like a sort of a selected area of the glyph, uh, it could have been filled in a lot, like along a line or it followed some kind of path of the letter. So I started with some sketching and um, started kind of setting out to write some code with, with the idea that I, I might end up with some set of tools where maybe I could apply a combination of styles to a letter. 
Um, even at this point, I wasn't even really thinking that it had to be Surveyor. This was just this was just the space that I was working in. I was already working so closely with the outlines and Surveyor. Um, but I set out to start kind of trying to write some tools to solve these these problems that I that I think I found. Um, so kind of starting off with uh, maybe this form where I was kind of thinking of it as a sort of a subdivision of, of, of an overall panel within a letter. Um, so taking the A, I was trying to think how would I, how would I recreate a shape like that uh, in code? And again, I'm not going to show any code examples, but uh, you know, I, I needed to find a way to kind of give some instruction, I guess, to describe what I was looking for. And then that would, that would turn into code uh, one way or another. But uh, looking at a letter A, I was thinking if I was able to isolate maybe one half of part of a letter and then maybe another half of part of a letter, so if I was able to somehow describe that in code or somehow have some kind of setup within a glyph that maybe then I could, I could freely interpolate between the two of those. So using interpolation not to uh, interpolate one glyph with another glyph to maybe make a, a medium glyph but uh, interpolation could be a tool or a technique that could be used in lots of different places. So maybe I could say, I really want to interpolate this blue line with this red line and end up with this green line halfway. And just like when you're setting up uh, your glyphs for interpolation for the type designers in the audience, you know, you, you just need the same number of points, you know, in each contour, it's the, the same basic kind of things. But maybe it could be possible to, to make an interpolation, is what I was thinking. Um, and then if I can interpolate halfway, then maybe that means I could really interpolate 25% of the way or 75% of the way. And maybe that's all I really wanted. Maybe I wanted to see just part of this sliver, so that 75%, you know, something like this. And once you have a, a system and once you have like an actual script or something that you've written to do this, then you get to run it on the next letter and the next letter. And this is really, I, I saw this as a, as a just a, a starting point for um, just kind of prototyping an idea. So maybe this wouldn't be the final drawing of something, but uh, what's great about uh, writing, a, writing a script or writing a tool to do this is that um, it's not going to make the design decisions for you. So like in, in the example of this queue, um, I look at the result that comes out of a script like that, and I don't like the way that the overlap happens. Um, but it's not really the job of the tool to make that decision and to choose like the way that it should really look in the end. Um, maybe I'm really just making a tool just to save me the time of shading every glyph a little bit. And so I get to, you know, instead of spending my time drawing all these contours, I can just, uh, you know, run it and have it get me most of the way there. Um, because the real, uh, the real power in you know making your own tool to do this is that you can change some of the settings and then you end up with with that you know on every glyph or whatever. So um, yeah, so it was just supposed to be like kind of a this was a early kind of exploration at um, <clears throat> just trying to see if I can get one of these things working. Um, I spent a little bit bit of time as well trying to shade these panels in with some ornamentation, so kind of like following some lines and placing some components and things and drawing some shadows. Um, but what I kept really coming back to as I was flipping through a lot of reference material uh, was this sample. So this is from uh, just the book that I took this from is from uh, 19th century ornament and ornamented uh, typefaces. Um, and I really kept coming back to this page that this looked like it was something that seemed so impossible to kind of describe in code. You know, the thing I was showing you already with just kind of shading part of a panel, uh, that was enough of a struggle just to get that working, but how was I going to do this? This is really what I felt was, was going to be my challenge. And even though the form that shaded looks nothing like Surveyor, that was still, those are the outlines I was still working in. That was the, the stuff I was already kind of comfortable with. So that's, that's where I was going to continue with it. Um, and I was really thinking more about it, just kind of going back to that previous kind of example I was showing. I was thinking that maybe I was already kind of partway there. Maybe I was already doing something that can get me kind of close a little bit. Um, taking this A, again, looking at you know the sides of a glyph, so maybe like the left side or the right side of sort of a, a main area of, of weight or like a panel within a glyph. 
um, interpolating and interpolating and interpolating and more and more kind of drawing these ridges, it felt like maybe it was sort of like a wireframe for and if, I, and if I kind of cut it in half and only keep half of them, you know, it looked like it was kind of a wireframe for what I kind of wanted here. So it still wasn't shaded in with any kind of like actual lighting. It was just uh, just these ridges on a glyph. But I thought this is really, this, this must be a start to something. I think this is the way that it can kind of get me uh, going toward what I'm, what I'm really interested in. Um, so it was also, it was, it was really around this time that I was really exploring these different ideas in programming and in drawing with code. And um, I was kind of hitting a wall, I think, with uh, my abilities. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking back at this and thinking, like, how do I, where do I even go from here? What do I do with that? Like, this is interesting, but, but what do I do next? And um, I had just taken, 10 weeks away from, from work, I went back to school for a little bit at the, uh, there's a course in the city here called the School for po Poetic Computation. And it was really kind of an amazing 10 week program where, uh, you know, I wanted to go back to school for programming. Com being as a designer, I really wanted to find the right place that kind of fit with uh, what I think I needed. Because so many, uh, so many programming and developing courses that are out there are really maybe more for engineering or maybe only if you're like a web developer, they seem really specific. But um, what was great about the School for Poetic Computation is that it was completely open and you make what you want out of it. And so I got to experience a lot of different things. I was working with animation and I was working with robotics and I was working with everything that really wasn't type design for 10 weeks. Um, and while I was there, I was really kind of influenced by, by a few things and I really thought differently about the kind of problems that I was running into in programming and design just by doing something kind of different for a while. Um, <clears throat> and I started thinking about animation, uh, how animation could relate to kind of this design problem that I'm looking at here. And so I was thinking that the, the drawings that we have uh, in Robofont, they all, like every contour within a glyph or every segment within a contour, uh, there's an order and a sequence for them, so there's always like the first contour within a glyph, and the second one, the third one. But then every contour has a start point. And this is just like kind of the nature of the drawing. This is sort of how the, the data is kept uh, behind what you see there. You don't always kind of see this, but um, there's always a, yeah, an, a sequence to the contours, a start point, and a direction that they all move. Um, so my thinking was that maybe this is a way to work with trying to draw within a glyph. I was going to follow some kind of sequence through my drawings, and then so maybe if we if we you know if we know the sequence of of segments, then maybe we can step along them and do something. So maybe we could sort of subdivide these uh, these uh, segments that we're drawing with, and sure maybe draw some dots or. Uh, maybe do something a little bit more elaborate. So uh, just describing in code a way to kind of walk through the drawing and do something. This is, what, this is how I was able to wrap my head around, I think, what I wanted to do was uh, I had these, these contours that were drawn on that A, just those, those lines that didn't have any weight to them, they didn't have any shading to them. Uh, but I was going to think about it with more of a, a solution from animation somehow. That's, that's at least that's what I was kind of thinking about. Um, so sure, like as we're moving through a drawing, maybe we know the angle of the line as you go through it, and you could do something with that. So the angle of this extra line I'm drawing on it could change, um, or maybe you can kind of you know fake like a broad edge pin or something just by kind of like tracing through a drawing. Um, or I've made all these in Drawbot, so I, you could do something completely ridiculous as well. So I just had to do that one there. Yeah. Uh, but but in, in all honesty and seriousness, this is how I was really kind of trying to think about it. I was trying to think about uh, describing to a tool how to kind of walk through a drawing, and then I was going to figure out what to do within this canvas that I'm drawing in as I move along it. I know this might sound really abstract, and I might be losing some people here, but this is how I was how I was thinking about it, um, of these ridges that had no shading on them. 
Um, and I was going to move through them one at a time, stepping along them and making something happen. So, uh, let's see if this starts. So you start with just one contour, maybe split it into segments. And as I walked along the segment, or at least in code, as it moved along that one stripe, uh, I was able to compare its angle to maybe this, the angle of this uh, uh, imaginary light source, which is that yellow line coming through. So as I'm kind of like just uh, moving along the curve, uh, if the angle of the curve at that point matched up with the light source, then maybe it would be at, at the brightest, it would be reflecting the most light. And then on the opposite side of it, if it was kind of perpendicular to it, uh, maybe it wouldn't be getting any light. So kind of further along in the curve, uh, maybe no light is hitting there. And so I was walking through and just kind of expanding this path as I went along. And the results were very crude, but this was really kind of a starting point, I think. Um, and so early, an early look at things, this was the first set of glyphs that I built out of that. And I remember thinking, this is so exciting. This is really working. Maybe I'm really kind of getting somewhere with this. Because um, at least these glyphs look great, even though that was just still really crude and really rough. Um, then on the other hand, I continued running with, with more glyphs to fill out the rest of the character set. And things were looking more like this, where it didn't look so hot. There was still a lot of promise there in what I was doing, but uh, things didn't look so consistent as I compared them back to these more round kind of shapes. You know, so these round shapes were getting lit in a really nice way, even though the, the idea behind it was very rough and crude, but maybe more of the flat angled shapes weren't looking so good. Um, so it's at a point like this where starting from this, this point of having a little tool, a little script that's shading something, um, it's really the standard kind of design process where you're working as a, as, as a designer with an editor. So Jonathan Heffler would uh, be meeting with me with my design proofs, really. And instead of going back to change drawings, I'd be going back to change the code. So we'd be coming up with new ideas for how the, the code could shade the drawing a little bit differently or how the, the drawing just needed to be set up a little bit differently to, to shade in the right way. Um, and then what should really happen with some of the details that we're looking at in Surveyor. So over time, it was a, a lot of back and forth of, uh, you know, there'd be a, a review, I'd come back, make some changes. And the beauty of using a, a tool that you've written is you can make those changes and run it again, and then you have a whole new font to print out and, and uh, look at. Um, but you can see things are very rough at this point. Um, this is still, it's a, it's a tool that's supposed to get me 90% of the way there, again. This was never a tool that was meant to draw everything perfectly, but it, it's the kind of thing that I was supposed to be able to maybe turn a few dials, adjust a few parameters, and uh, kind of prototype some of these ideas with shading. Um, so for instance, one of the parameters that I was able to work into the tool is we thought that um, maybe the angle of light needs to change between different places. So I control over setting the angle, so here the light's coming straight down from the top, or adjust the angle a little bit, run it again, run it again, and just have that same tool just kind of shaded again. So the results are still very rough. If you really look at the contours, they're, they're not perfect and they're not final, but they're never really meant to be. It's, it's meant to be a prototyping tool that I can kind of come back and change some settings and then try it again and try it again, that kind of a thing. So the angle of the light was always one parameter, and then maybe even choosing a different set of ridges, a different number of ridges. So maybe try it with three ridges or with six, I guess. Is that five or six? Um, that would take a day to draw again if I was going to add one more ridge to a drawing, if I decided that it needed just one more kind of highlight in there. Um, so it's really a, it's a design process of doing some work and proofing in the context that, that I thought it might be used. So it was a lot of looking at printouts on paper, lots of different sizes, and you know, we'd realize that maybe it needs a uh, you know, little bit of change here or there. Um, another thing that we had access to was maybe the brightness, the overall brightness of this highlight. So this was another kind of variable that I was able to work out and change. Um, and all these kinds of things happened over time. So early on, it was just shading things the same way, and that's why it, ever, it looked you know, really rough and 
those caps didn't look so good. But over time, we found that we needed some more control over the drawing. And so uh, there were many, many, many rounds of, of adding these kinds of things. Um, and the last sort of parameter that I had kind of built into the tool was this. Um, we thought that maybe the interplay between the inside and the outside contours, the inside and the outside shading needed to have some kind of control where maybe we can add a little bit of more overlap between the two. So kind of like rotating these curves. Um, so over time with these kind of adjustments, we were able to you know, crank out some fonts that were looking quite a lot better. Um, so it was really, it was just the normal design process, but instead of a lot of drawing, it was a lot of programming, I guess. Because um, yeah, we, we saw early on that uh, using the same settings also between Roman and Italic, that uh, th these two O's that are shaded the same way with the same angle of light, they actually look pretty good. They look like they fit together. But when you switch and look at the H, maybe, then just having that italic H at a different angle, it's kind of just getting more sun on its face, you know? It's, uh, it's getting lit a little bit more than, uh, than the Roman was. So we thought, OK, well, we're going to need to be able to change these settings. We thought, or at least I thought at first that, you know, of course, there'd just be one angle of light. We'll cast it on everything. And then that's just going to be like the really like the scientific, the proper way to do it. Everything's just lit the same way. Um, but, but no, like type design is a lot about optical corrections and making things look like they actually work together as a system instead of just kind of trusting that perfectly geometric circle or, you know, trusting like just a measurement. Uh, you should kind of go back to trust your eye a little bit. And um, so we decided that for, okay, so the italics might need a different angle to the light just to make them feel compatible with the Roman. Um, but then even within one style, uh, this H and this A, the A wasn't quite a fit. You know, it's a little bit too low contrast, just the way that it's lit like that. So maybe even the A needs kind of like, kind of some help uh, in a different angle of light so that it would look more like it fits with the H. So there was a lot of fine tuning we were finding early on that every glyph is probably going to need something a little bit custom. And it's not, it's not so much of trying to write one tool or make one script that you could just run on any font and have it crank out like a new shaded 3D kind of font. But uh, this is a tool that the designer that, that we were going to use in the office to um, really kind of fine tune everything along the way. <clears throat> um, and then even within one glyph, so this is kind of a more extreme case. Uh, so within one glyph, if everything's shaded the same way, we kind of thought, OK, so that sort of smaller panel on the top right uh, that's way too bright. It's trying to fit all those, you know, five ridges or whatever in there. And maybe even like the angle of light isn't so good on that, the ball terminal. So we got to a point where the tool let us kind of change all these settings on every part that was shaded so that something like this would end up more like this. Um, you know, at first I really kind of thought that I, I liked when I look at one glyph, I kind of liked the way that that sort of main stroke looked like it took a long time to transition uh, the light between both sides. But then when you, you run the script, you, pr you uh, generate the font, and you proof it, and you're looking at it as it's going to be used, and you know, the ampersand just doesn't look like it fits the system that you're trying to build, and that it really maybe just needs to be a little bit more higher contrast to kind of fit with like that H and the O, those kind of things. Um, and so <clears throat> again, this is really, this is the output from that tool, it's still kind of rough. There's a lot of uh, the there's corners and places where they really kind of shouldn't be. Uh, I want to show you right now kind of the difference between what would automatically sort of come out of it, and then the next step. Once we finally had everything settled, once we really kind of liked the way that everything was lit, um, it really was a, a long process of uh, fine tuning and sanding down all the edges to turn something like this into this. So uh, it's a lot of small changes in some places, but then other places it could be bigger changes. There could be a lot of going back and redrawing things. Um, but I still, I just want to like make the point here that uh, this tool that I was using wasn't making these final perfect drawings that you end up with in, in uh, Obsidian. Um, <clears throat> and I had, I had a lot of help as well. You know, it wasn't just me, I'm the one speaking about this. It was really a, a group effort within the office and we had, um, uh, there was a, he was, a, he was actually, he was our intern for many years, Luke Joyner, uh, helped out quite a lot with this project at this point. Um, 
so as we're going through and as we're proofing more and more and as we're looking at it, um, coming back, trying to make this tool kind of build the things that we wanted it to build and make it look the way that we wanted it to look, um, we weren't really satisfied with the way that a lot of these more flat filled in areas looked. So if we look at maybe like this capital R, the, the curves are so dynamic and they're so brightly lit at some points and they're so shadowy at other points, but you really kind of miss that on the left half of the R or like on the entire cap H or cap I, these kind of things. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to go back and find a way to like bring some more motion, I guess, into the, into the way that those are, are lit. Um, and I, I went back to some of that inspiration that I found through animation again at, at the School for Product Computation. Um, I thought that maybe I could solve this problem by uh, writing or putting together what could be known as an easing algorithm. So kind of uh, when you're looking at motion, for example, these two dots, uh, they'll move to the other side of the screen, arrive at the same time and come back at the same time, but the top dot is moving at a steady speed the entire time as it goes there and comes back. But the bottom dot is really kind of like, it eases into motion, it gets up to speed very quickly, and then it slows down as it gets to the end. So it looks a little bit more natural as it moves. Even though they're, they're you know, moving to one side, they arrive at the same time and they come back at the same time, but it just kind of takes a smoother route to get there. And so this is a, <clears throat> a really basic concept um, that people that work in you know, motion graphics and animation kind of deal with and moving things, you know, with, uh, across the screen. But it was new to me and so it was something that was kind of on my mind a lot as I was working on this. So I thought maybe there's a way that I can kind of, as I'm moving through my drawing and as I'm drawing on these curves and expanding paths, maybe I just need to use some kind of easing algorithm to not just start and stop on some of these panels at the same time. Um, so maybe a better <clears throat> visualization of this is even uh, this one where if you chart the speed over the course of time, you'll see they arrive at the same time, but uh, the one at the bottom starts out slower, so there's longer bars for that, and then it gets very quick in the middle, so they're shorter, a little bit more spaced out, and then at the end it kind of slows down again. Um, so this is what I was thinking, maybe this is a way to bring some movement into the way that I was shading these forms uh, by looking at some animation techniques. Um, and I say, I was referring to this as an, an easing algorithm. Uh, that word algorithm, it, it could sound so like, what does that really mean? What do you mean by algorithm? It's, it sounds so, so technical. Um, an algorithm is really just like a recipe. It's a, it's a set of instructions to follow. So for instance, maybe an easing algorithm just to kind of break it down into like what's, what's really going on? How do you slow something down like that? Um, <clears throat> maybe this could be an easy algorithm. Maybe the, the idea is to uh, start from the point. So I'll, I'll give instructions to this dot. I'll say start from the point that you're at now and move a quarter of the way to the end. So if it starts, it moves a quarter of the way and then it stops. And then I say, okay, from the point you're in now, move a quarter of the way to the end. So it remeasures, moves a quarter of the way, and so on, and so on. So the instruction is just to always move a quarter of the way and then reassess, a quarter of the way, reassess. And so over time, these little quarters get very, very, very small down to where they would actually really never kind of end. There's always a way to shave something down to like a quarter of the way left. So it gets very slow at the end. But this could be an algorithm. This could be a way to describe the way to, to ease movement across a glyph. It's just, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's nothing, nothing really more than that. So I went back to those drawings and, um, oh yeah, so here it is at full speed. So that's that same easing algorithm from the previous one, but just kind of sped up. So you can see it starts very quick because it's making bigger jumps and then it really kind of slows down at the end. <coughs> This is also the point in class where I'd ask if there are any questions, but this isn't a normal <laughs> class. But we'll get to those. Um, so I took this kind of stuff. I, I know I'm just like kind of dumping all these things that were like on my mind over the past like few years and things that I was like influenced by as I was trying to make this thing happen. Um, <clears throat> and so I went back to that drawing of the R. And so uh, again, as I was following those paths, as the code was stepping through those paths and drawing, 
instead of it just drawing the same width path the entire way through, uh, I tried to apply some easing to it so that maybe it would kind of ease its way out. So at the end, it gets a little bit wider. There's a little bit more of a highlight to the bottom. And I thought this was pretty interesting. It, it kind of looks like maybe, uh, yeah, there's a little bit more movement or motion to that, that entire uh, stroke. Um, so you try this, and then you go back and think, well, maybe, maybe I'll tweak the settings on how it's easing, and maybe I'll try something like this. So it's really bright at the top, and then it's darker toward the bottom. Um, and again, I was really just trying to find something that would match the kind of uh, yeah sparkle, I guess, that you find in the, in the curves within Obsidian. Try to bring a little bit of that kind of highlight back into these flat shapes. Um, and then I tried maybe a combination of two of those, so it starts really bright and then it ends, you know, with just a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> and so it's round for round, kind of working in the code and trying it again. And I ended up with something more like this, where it's <clears throat> kind of a combination of the two, but then it even eases in as it gets more toward the, the middle of the glyph <clears throat> to kind of kind of center the highlight up a little bit. So it looks like it has a little bit more dimension. Um, and so, yeah, again, what's nice about uh, making a tool to help you draw these things. Again, this is just for prototyping. There's still a lot of work that goes on afterwards to really kind of make sure that curves are in the right place and fix the drawings. But uh, with a prototyping tool, you can find your old PDFs like I did and go from earlier in the day where the typeface looked like this, and then later in the day, the change is very subtle on screen here, but you know, it has a little something different. So you're able to kind of like adjust the settings, run it again, take a look at it again, and then the next day, try something different. So, yeah, it's not going to do all the work for you, but it's really, it's there just for, you know, for prototyping. Think about it that way. Um, and so then, in the end, maybe kind of ending up with something that uh, looks a little bit more dynamic than it did uh, the, week, the week before. Um, the, <clears throat> the tool that I was building as well could only go so far. We were running into a lot of questions like, uh, what should happen on these kind of bracketed serifs because uh, there really wasn't any clear thing to do like on that L or on the E. So it's rounds and rounds and rounds and months of trying, uh, you know, from sketching to writing some code to sketching in an illustrator, just making up words that have a lot of wedges in them uh, to try every kind of thing possible. So at this point it was really just as much of a design exercise as it was, uh, you know, trying to solve some technical issues. But um, yeah, re it wasn't always perfectly clear what uh, what every shape was supposed to do with with these instructions. Um, and then a lot of glyphs as well through this design process over the months, we'd realized that they really kind of need to be to be re redesigned. Uh, I started from Surveyor. I started from the fine black version of Surveyor. But uh, once you have things shaded in so much, maybe that asterisk looks like it's a little little lacking, so maybe it needs to be bigger, and it's going to be used in maybe a more ornamental way. And then the dagger and the double dagger, maybe those could be redrawn. So there are a lot of glyphs that uh, we went back and started from scratch from Surveyor, so it's still different in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm really thankful to Jonathan for making this note of not trying to shade in that Pilcrow like this. He says, we'll save you a world of pain <laughs> to try something different. So, so don't try to stay to Surveyor. Let's try something new here. And it actually worked out really well. Um, but a lot of glyphs as well, they just needed the kind of changes to them that you, wouldn't nor you just wouldn't probably notice if, you're, if you had Surveyor and Obsidian side by side that early on trying to shade in the N was looking like the one on the left. But we decided that maybe the, the light wasn't landing the right way um, in that bottom right corner. So just things needed to rotate and move around just to, to shade in the right way. So there are a lot of these kind of changes throughout all of Obsidian. So Obsidian really isn't just completely a shaded in surveyor, but there's a, a lot of changes to make it work. Um, and then the ligatures had to be redrawn. Um, so this ball terminal, it did make the cut. And a lot of it was just to kind of like try to get uh, the different forms to, to line up the right way. So you might want to redraw that ball terminal as it overlaps the L, just so that it's shaded in like kind of a nice 50-50 way with the L. Um, but in the end, yeah, the same process was used for, for the full range of glyphs. So 
kind of everything in the Roman that you'd expect. So there's caps, small caps, all the accented characters, um, and it's it's available. I had to work in a couple of keynote transitions, so it's also there's the background version and then with highlights. <laughs> so so you can. Uh, when you purchase Obsidian, you, you get it as a, a, a full font that has the shading on it, but also it's separated so they have a highlight layer that you can add if you want to like change the color. Um, and then through the, the entire italic, so just pretty much everything, swashes and everything. Um, and so that's where we kind of wound up with it. Um, I want to give a quick demonstration of kind of what we were looking at a little bit in the tool as we were using it, so not like showing any code that kind of goes into it because that's boring. But um, this is kind of what the interface looked like as we'd be drawing a lot of the time. So there's sort of a preview in this Robofont drawing window of what the, this kind of like wireframe of ridges kind of looks like and then a control panel that doesn't look too nice but it has everything there to change all these settings for like lighting angles and, and those kind of things. Um, but what I want to do is I'll, I'll switch over to Robofont and show you kind of a little demonstration. Let's see. So I put this together, yes, and it just barely fits. Um, so this wasn't the tool that we used that when, uh, when we were working, so I put kind of like a nicer looking one together for you guys, just to kind of demonstrate some of the parameters that we, that we use though. Um, Actually, I'm going to run, it just barely gets cut off. I'm going to run a smaller one I have. I was worried about this. Maybe that's a little better. Cool. Um, so what we'd really have, we'd, we'd have all these settings that we could really kind of control and then run it and see what the glyph looked like. And you change some more settings and run it and see what it looks like. Um, so I can kind of move the light angle and I can say, you know, maybe maybe this is a better angle or I can kind of move it that way and try to decide and have it reshade each time and have it, you know, show me something different. Um, the way we'd kind of use it, we'd find some kind of overall settings that look good throughout that, that style. So whether it was the Roman, the Italic, we choose kind of a light angle that looked pretty good throughout and then a, a brightness setting that, you know, try to find something that looks generally good on every letter. And then you really kind of go in and we were fine tuning the parameters on everything. So um, for instance, maybe this panel down here, maybe that actually looks pretty good as it is. So there's five ridges and I like the, the angle of light. I like how bright it is. Um, this one on the other hand, this is, I know this is the third one in my example. Uh, it's a little bit washed out. It's way too bright. I think, you know, it just looks kind of out of place uh, compared to the other panels in the glyph. Uh, so maybe I'll take that one and say that it really needs four ridges and then maybe the problem is also with the angle. So now I'm just working in kind of like one corner of the glyph, changing the settings or maybe it was really kind of a, a brightness kind of issue. Maybe we can change that one. Uh, maybe, maybe that's my angle. And then through here, through like the middle of the glyph, this is, I know this is panel number two for me. Um, maybe it actually needs more ridges, you know, six or seven. And so again, like that would take all day to draw one more ridge, but when you have a script do it for you, it's kind of nice. So uh, the drawings are still a little rough. You can see as I go through it, there's a lot of, you know, there are rounding errors that come up, but they actually look kind of nice, I think. Even the, the roughness looks kind of handmade. Um, but I'd say, no, maybe, you know, maybe six is more appropriate, but the angle of that one, just to get the contrast, I guess, through that, the middle of the, the, the glyph, probably I'd want to go this way or all the way up this way, you know, not something kind of halfway in between. Um, so, you know, maybe it's that. And then for this panel, I think you can kind of see where this is going. You really just kind of have control over everything. Um, and then, yeah, and then you move on to the next glyph, the next glyph. But uh, again, so this is just, that kind of a prototyping tool where we'd be able to quickly see some shading and then then spend months and months kind of doing the polishing and the, the fixing up of them. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where I wanted to land with this. This is kind of a look at a lot of things that came into Obsidian, uh, starting from some weird ideas and some strange exploration and yeah, ended up with, with this. So uh, thank you guys very much. I'd like to open it for questions as well. Yeah, 
So if there are questions, um, I see a question. I know there's a microphone because it's on the audio. I wonder if we need to. Oh, we had a question right up here. Hey, mine's really quick. Uh, okay, yeah. Are you ever going to sell this, the, like the piece of software, or make it available to people? Actually, I mean, that's really the thing. That, yeah, the question is if, if we're going to sell the software. But uh, I'm, I guess I'm kind of talking more about a way of working where maybe you'd, you'd make a tool that fits maybe even only one typeface. So I'm not even sure if I'd use this tool as it is now with the next typeface and the next one. So yeah. uh, it really is kind of built for a way of working that I think fits uh, the design that I was working on at the time. But a lot that goes into it and a lot of the like fundamental ways that maybe it works could could be carried on to the next thing, but um, but no, it's it's kind of up to you to, to make your own. For that. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. Do you think how do you think it would apply if you put a different plugged it into a different lettering style like like a maybe monolinear sans serif like or something or a wood typey thing like this right, sample that's you thing. showed? Yeah, it actually it probably wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah. It kind of needs the it yeah. needs the contrast and the, to be able to that's find right, those yeah. inner and outer strokes. Yeah, Crazy. so I think you've seen for this one at least. Yeah, it, yeah. it kind of needs a lot of high contrast to kind of separate areas to shade in and. So at least with this method and this sort of train of thought and how to shade a letter in, like maybe it's really only going to work here. Yeah. yeah. But it'd be exciting to solve that problem in a sans serif as well, I think. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it would be. <laughs> yeah. But it goes back to that same thing of like, you know, maybe my circle is different than your circle and Frederick not even wanting to have a circle tool in his app, like make your own circle tool. Yeah. But yeah, it's a... Uh, I could never draw that circle, that's for sure. So. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I think there's one up here. Well, some people here would know the answer to this, but okay. anyway, it's an interesting question for me. If we go back to the original surveyor, yeah. and when you were developing the interpolation tool, yeah. you had a curve that was determined after running the tool to be needing some tweaking or imperfect. Yeah. The question is, was it imperfect um, for the shape before interpolation? In other words, the original shape? Did the tweaking that you did for right. the interpolation on the original yeah. uh, letter yeah. I wonder improve if I the original letter, or was it not even needed? It was so <coughs> subtle that it only applied to and, interpolation. And, and that example is actually, if I could find it real quick, I'll bring it up. Uh, so it was this one. Uh, so the the change to that location where that point is on the curve actually didn't change the curve at all. It was kind of like trying to decide, is there a better place along that curve to put this point that could still draw the same shape and that could then also draw like a better interpolation along the way. So uh, the fact that this point is right here and it's making the curve look like that there actually might still be another place further on in the curve that you could add a point and not have that one and then hopefully still get the same design out of it. And so uh, that was a lot that kind of went into the tools when I was working on Surveyor is, uh, yeah, trying to maybe move points along curves or trying to find a, a better location for a point within a curve where it wouldn't change the design because we've been drawing and proofing this drawing, and we don't want that to change just for an interpolation. So the happen. original design didn't need any improvement. You simply <coughs> needed a point that would accommodate the interpolation. Yeah, and that's actually a, a great question in that, yeah, it wasn't to improve the drawing, but is it is to improve the, the mechanics of that kind of next step of the process that we want to take. We wanted to make these interpolations through a, a wide range of weights, and for that to happen, uh, we were going to need to really get these points in the, in the, the right place. Yeah. Because otherwise, yeah, the halfway wouldn't look so good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I have two short questions. Yeah. Uh, the first one is if this project started with the idea of doing an ornamental version of Surveyor, or if it was just that a style worked the best with whatever you were trying to do. Yeah. And the second is just kind of the mechanics of like, am I understanding right that there's kind of an underlying just flat color? And then on top of it, you draw these panels, and those are kind of the highlighted uh, forms. Yeah. Um, let me see. So for the first part of the question, um, yeah, I was designing in Surveyor, and it was 
you know, I came into the project so far in Surveyor, like I wasn't at, you know, the, the beginning of, of the design process. So I was really kind of like maybe taking a different look, I guess, at some of the source material, like in my own way and kind of thinking that like, oh, it, it would be fun to kind of do some of this stuff, but I know we're not doing that. So I think that was part of what was on my mind that I, I did want to explore that. I wanted to find a way just to kind of sketch around with that. And I think I found uh, using it as a, as a programming challenge was maybe a way to do that so that I can kind of, uh, with the drawings I was already becoming familiar with and with uh, these yeah, outlines I was very familiar with that I could maybe try to kill two birds and try to become a slightly better programmer in, in some cases and also make some things that I, that I really like to, like to make. Um, but I, I think really early on, uh, the idea really wasn't to make uh, a, com you know, a complete set of uh, ornamented surveyor fonts, but uh, I wanted to kind of have this arsenal of tools that maybe I could apply some style or some ornamentation here or there, or maybe we'd even use them in the future, which uh, you know, there's a lot more exploration that, w that went into it than the ones that I've shown today, so you know, it'll still kind of come out in some other places. But, um, at least at first it was just working so well with Surveyor that we just kind of stuck with it, yeah. But then of course, you know, made a lot of changes to the outlines to make it work, yeah. Um, with the second part of the question, say it again. Uh, it was just about <coughs> the mechanics of like, do you oh, yeah. have an underlying layer and then panels yeah. on top of it? I think, I think that's kind of the way that I was just again able to like kind of wrap my head around it. Like what am I seeing in, in the material that I, that I like and I kind of want to recreate and how do I describe it to myself? And because then once you can kind of describe it to yourself, then maybe hopefully you can kind of program it that way. You know, it's, it's not just magic, but you kind of have to find a way to really decide like what, what would a system be that could turn this into that? And then you can try to find a way to do it. So for me, I was always thinking of this is an area that could be shaded in. Maybe it's a, it's a panel that can take some ornamentation or something can happen in it. So I was always using the name panel for that, that kind of thing, yeah. Thanks. Christian, way back there. I think we need a. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's apparent that the whole project was sort of this balance between man versus machine, if you want, sort of like this component of automation versus um, this manual optical correction. So I was just okay. curious if in the end you felt that anything came to this typeface that wasn't in your original vision, or was it something that uh, sure. you were trying to manipulate <coughs> programming to give you your original version? Like, yeah, I think is it, it really... more man or more machine, basically? Yeah, I, I think it, it kind of went both ways, where, um, yeah, like you, you, I set out with this challenge by looking at that one sample that I found in a book, and I thought, I'm going to do something like this, and it ended up pretty far away from it. It still has kind of shaded ridges and this sort of a light source, but you know, it was never meant to be a revival. And um, I think I kind of let the process sort of take me somewhere with it. But uh, yeah, you go into shading a letter and you get things set up and you're running something with some settings and a lot of surprises will come back at you and you think like, wow, I didn't really expect it was going to look like that. And um, yeah, I think it was kind of both ways, trying to tame the tool to work the way that I wanted it to, but then uh, kind of also being open to having some chance come out of it as well. Yeah, um, yeah, because the whole thing, that, that's what's kind of amazing about this project, that Obsidian didn't happen by, we didn't all come into a meeting and say, okay, what's the next typeface that we want to work on is, it's going to be this, let's do it. But um, I'm really thankful to my colleagues at Heffler and Company for giving me the space to kind of explore some weird new ideas and, uh, you know, let these, let these ideas kind of evolve into something that actually ended up looking kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. But I've always kind of thought about, I don't know, maybe I'm watching like a lot of woodworking videos on YouTube or something, but it's almost like uh, <clears throat> the tool is like trying to turn a bowl out of a lathe. Like you have a big machine that's like spinning and you're gonna scoop a whole bunch of wood out of it. You can get the rough shape out of like a big machine, but then uh, it takes a lot of sanding and oiling and you know, uh, working that, that piece of wood into a nice looking bowl in the end. So you kind of can't expect just to put like a log in one end and have an amazing thing come out the other end. So the tool's there just to kind of uh, assist you. Cause yeah, that bowl would take quite a long time to make if you had to cut it out with like a little, you know, chisel or something. Yeah, 
So there's always, yeah, kind of the, the play back and forth of uh, trying to get a lot of your work done by prototyping with a tool, but then definitely always trusting your eye and going back and making the changes that you see fit. Yep. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. If that's it, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>